Our next presenter is Kim Moore Bailey. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer of Youth Outside. Ms. Bailey draws on 25 years of experience in strategic planning and community engagement to provide the leadership and vision that drives Youth Outside's work to ensure that young people who have traditionally or historically been un underrepresented in the outdoor movement have the opportunity to connect with nature in culturally relevant and inclusive ways. Please help me in welcoming Kim Moore Bailey. Great. How is everybody? Thank you for sticking around. It's been a, a great day. Do people need to stand up and stretch? <laughs> stretch? Yes. <laughs> so we've heard um, some incredible examples today about the wonderful benefits of spending time in nature. And there's been a lot of energy uh, and focus either in, definitely stated or at least implied that in order to receive these benefits, it's also really important that there is a sense of equitable access to nature, right? That these benefits are not just exclusive for those that have the opportunity to have that connection. And what I'm about to say, I don't want you to think that I don't believe that that is important as well. In fact, seven years ago when my organization Youth Outside started, we were actually very focused on this idea of equitable access to nature. Uh, and as we started to think about it and talk about it, we very quickly also realized that um, it's actually not enough. This idea of equitable access uh, actually fell short, that equitable access didn't actually equal, um, let's say, safety, right? Or this idea of being comfortable in outdoor spaces or actually even feeling welcome in outdoor spaces. So if you are not necessarily feeling welcome or feeling safe in these spaces, then the benefits that we are looking to achieve are not being uh, received either. And so it was with this particular realization that we started to shift our conversations to think about racial equity as this key component as well in our work. And so today, we are specifically talking about the benefits of health. And in order to really receive the health benefits that nature provides, it's imperative that we really do center racial equity in our work. Because when racial equity is not centered in this work, some examples of things that tend to happen when there's racial inequity is that parks or being outside in nature tends to show up in ways that does not feel very safe, like the overpresence, perhaps, of uh, police in a park for some might feel safe. But if you are a black or Latino young male, uh, that could perhaps be a place that you do not want to be, right? Or if a refinery is in your community and it's one of those days where the air is really thick, that idea of spending time in your community park is also now not an option for you because going outside is a challenge, so therefore spending time in your neighborhood park is also not going to be an option for you. So the definition I'm using here by Strive Forward for Racial Equity states, or at least part of the definition, when someone's race does not determine their access, opportunities, treatment, or statistical outcomes in society. So that if we're going to ensure that everyone has the health benefits of a connection to nature, and we're going to use the racial equity framework to do so, then we also have to start asking ourselves the tough questions that come up, including how racism continues to impact people's access, opportunities, and treatment when they are forming a connection to nature. And in order to central racial equity, it's, it's tough, right? It's, it's tough and it's ongoing work. It's often the kind of work that someone doesn't um, come up to you afterwards and say, like, great job, you know, thanks for doing that. Um, but they do recognize when you don't, right? Um, so it's, it's really, it's critical for us to begin to do this work. Um, 
And it's critical for us to keep asking the question, how does racism impact access to our connection to nature? How does racism impact opportunities for our connection to nature? And how does racism impact the treatment of people when they try to connect to nature? And we can begin to address the inequity through our commitment to anti-racist policies, practices, attitudes, and actions. And it can be really challenging to envision what these might look like, but I can assure you that there are practices and programs and policies that are out there and models that we can turn to that are pretty amazing. And the outcomes can really be astounding. And I'm gonna share a couple of examples with you. So here's an example of an anti-racist policy. And it looks like New York City and their living schoolyards movement. Is there anybody here from Trust for Public Land before I start <coughs> celebrating their work? Wanted to give you credit in real, real life. OK. Um, so over the past 20 plus years, in partnership with the city of New York and the state of New York, and tens of thousands of student experts, the Trust for Public Land has supported the development of 200 living schoolyards. And I know this program was mentioned a little earlier as well. by converting asphalt schoolyards to cool green spaces that are open to everyone in the community after hours and on weekends. Um, this particular park happens to be in Brooklyn. This is allowing over 20,000 Brooklynites. They have now a new park within a 10 minute walk of their home. And since its inception overall, this, this program has helped neighborhoods stay cooler during heat waves. It's absorbing stormwater runoff. More than four million New Yorkers now live within a 10 minute walk of a park or a playground. So the outcome of this program over the last 20 years has really been through self-efficacy, through their community building. Because they are engaging the students in the schools and helping with the design, there is a real sense of community ownership. They're showing the community that they're trustworthy by opening up the schools during the weekends and after schools, and that the community deserves a healthy green space to play in. They are redistributing opportunities for health outcomes to the broader community in some of the most marginalized communities in New York City. Another example. to be around bugs and flies and spiders and mosquitoes and stuff. This is my first time camping ever. Don't put it on the tip, put it around it. I am. Let me not get. Oh God. Thank you. 
I just wanted to get out of school because learning is making me dizzy. I just need a break to come outside and just get some fresh air. I don't, I don't get to express my playtime outside because I'm always inside doing homework. When we turn all our lights off, we were able to see the stars and we could hear the birds chirping. It felt like I was in heaven or something. It feels really nice to immerse ourselves in the nature and stuff and all the trees and breathe in the fresh air. It makes me realize that we can't just kick all the bugs out, you know? We're here temporarily and this is where they live, pretty much. Instead of being inside, um, isolated, you could be outside thinking of new ways to invent things and make the planet better. And it was fun and I'm gonna do it um, next year. So the Oakland Goes Outside, uh, Oakland Goes Outdoors program is an example of an anti-racist practice. The outcome of this program is that those young people are experiencing nature for themselves for the first time. They're writing their own narrative as to what that experience means for them. They're learning about it through their teachers who are being trained um, from an outside program. So someone is not coming in, taking them on the experience, and then leaving. Their teachers are being trained, and their, the staff are being trained. Um, and this is a, a program. Um, the goal is that every middle school student in Oakland will have the opportunity to spend time in the outdoors through this program. Um, so an entire generation will have the chance to connect with nearby nature. This is something that happens um, actually in Oakland um, and experience it for the first time. Um, so an example of an anti-racist attitude was captured during the city's Connecting Children to Nature gathering in St. Paul, Minnesota last year. Mayor Carter was addressing a room full of participants representing cities from all over the country thinking about and working on creating equitable access to nature for children in their respective municipalities. And his comment here was actually uh, made after he made the following statement. We've been talking a lot about equity here in St. Paul, and sometimes the word feels like it's hard to define. And then I remembered a long time ago when I was in business school, the dean of my school easily defined equity. He said it means ownership, decision-making, power, and the ability to build transferable wealth. So Mayor Carter's desire to have the youth in his city own the nature in his city, own the trails, own the uh, ability to go camping at their local rec center. He is saying that he wants his young people to not, ha again, have someone take them on these experiences, sort of drop them off and then bring them back, but to actually have the sense of ownership. That for me was a, or just a wonderful example of uh, anti-racist anti, uh, attitude. Um, and then finally, I want to share with you an example of anti-racist actions. And this is the other video we wanted to pull up. In Oakland, we don't have a lot of grocery stores. I just really don't get it. The rich places have more food than normal places. Why don't we have a lot of grocery stores here? It's like they want us to die. It was late 2010, 
a bunch of news stories came out about Oakland being listed as the fifth most dangerous city in the U.S. The same cycles were, were still going on from 15, 20 years earlier. We are in what is defined as a USDA food desert. No one is starving, but people aren't getting the nutrition they need. And so I started doing some research, like what, what, what can be done? What if we made a, a sanctuary where kids could come and just do kid stuff, draw pictures, do art, dance, cook, have delicious food? When starting Acting on Verba, it was with that same thought in mind. When I first started the farm, the idea of eating something that I grew was weird. I don't know why it grew. I don't know how it grew, but it grew. Acton on Verbo now runs three farms. We sell the produce to restaurants, and 100% of those dollars are placed into special accounts for the kids. They deserve clean air. They deserve to be outside and be told that they have within them the potential to be anything. It's all for nothing if we don't make sure that our kids are safe and happy and secure. I like Camp AMV because of the farm and all the different plants that we get to plant. We'll dig up a hole in a sunny place, water it, you did put in compost, compost turns into dirt, it helps other plants grow, it just keeps going. Being a winner of the Renewal Awards with Allstate, some of the funds are going to start in a cooperatively owned grocery store. Here in East Oakland, a community owned grocery store will bring education, it will bring locally grown produce. It gives folks pride of place. One of the things that we've been trying to highlight the last few years is raising our voices and letting our youth know that what you think matters, what you care about, you need to fight for. This is, this is my goal. This is why I'm back in East Oakland, because when I grew up here, that wasn't a thing for us. I'm pretty sure I learned what acta non verba means. Acta non verba means deeds, not words. Don't only say it, be it. So Act Non Verba is really an anti-racist action. That's what anti-racist action looks like. Um, the outcome here is really that they are reclaiming their connection. They're reclaiming their connection and their relationship to the land, uh, to, their, to food, to economic independence, to their health. It's a social justice model. They're really pushing against social capitalism, um, and it's really about liberation. Um, and so just to wrap up here, uh, to just say, um, as you all are thinking about the, the work, thinking about health benefits, thinking about connecting uh, to, to nature, um, I ask you to also think about what does it mean to do it through a, what does it mean to do it through a racial equity lens? What does it mean to make sure that those connections are also being done in a way that centers racial equity so that young people that you see here are also having these opportunities in a way that's not a hand out, um, that is really putting all young people in the place that they also can receive the benefits through their, through their world and through their narrative. Thank you. <laughs>